Welcome to the Winging It Travel podcast with me, James Hammond. Every Monday, I'll be joined by guests to talk about their travel stories, travel tips, backpacking advice, and so much more. Right now, I'm taking the podcast on the road traveling with me. So tune in every week for short form episodes detailing all my travels alongside my Monday guest episode. Are you a backpacker, gap year student, or simply someone who loves to travel? Then this is the podcast for you, designed to inspire you to travel. There'll be stories to tell, tips to share, and experiences to inspire. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the second solo episode of 2024, as we delve into some interesting facts, figures, news, and brand updates for today's episode. And we're going to kick off with some travel news. Read a report from CNN is claiming that airfares are the lowest since 2009, or specifically to the United States. Their travel expert, Katie Nastro, says that the airfare is nearly a quarter less than it was pre-pandemic and hasn't been this cheap since 2009, which is quite interesting. They claim this is the first full normal year since COVID, and they don't expect the prices to skyrocket any time. The interesting thing here is that the day-to-day life of the living crisis in terms of food, gas, mortgage rates is extremely high, but it's very interesting that travel is cheap. It doesn't really make sense when people don't have the spare cash to go and travel anyway, but at least some internal flights in USA and maybe even in Europe when I was traveling last year, very cheap. That is an option if you can afford it. But the single biggest factor, as always, with cheap flights and cheap airlines is competition. There seems to be a number of low cost airlines and they want to be in the mix to get the lowest prices possible to the consumer and drive their sales up. Next on the travel news is Venice is going to start selling day tickets for day visitors. So this was talked about last year and maybe the year before. And when we traveled to Venice last year, it was on the news and in the pipeline. But there's a caveat here. And as I said, it's day tickets for day visitors. So the obvious thing to do here is if you go to Venice, is stay a night or two nights. I would advise three or four nights in Venice. There's lots to see and do. And stay at a local hotel because then you contribute to the economy and you're not really seen as one of those tourists that come in for the day and leave, which I don't think are looked favourably upon. And they've got some dates that it specifies. So it's not all year round. They've got some dates that they will declare, which I'll read out in a minute, where day ticket prices and day ticket rules will come into place and they can be purchased online and they'll be required to visit if you don't stay overnight the fee will cost five euros or in us dollars five dollars 43 cents and will be in effect for travelers over 14 years old from 8 30 to 4 p.m very keen to see how they're going to manage that and police that it's going to be interesting the fee is the first of its kind experiment aims at managing visitor influx more effectively preserving the city's unique heritage so the kind of discouraging sort of go in and get out i discourage that as well i'm actually quite glad it's coming in i would advise go and stay there for a couple of days don't have to pay the fee go and see the place properly and have a great time so these are the dates it's going to be effective in april 25th to 30th may 1st to 5th may 11th to 12th may 18th to 19th may 25th to 26th june 8th to 9th June 15th to 16th, June 22nd to 23rd, June 29th to 30th, July 6th to 7th, and July 13th to the 14th. And you'll have to pay in advance and you'll get a QR code, which you must show to officials at the main access points in Venice. There is a fine and it can range from 50 euros to 300 euros. I'm not sure how they define what it is, maybe it depends on the type of day, not sure, or even if it's outside of certain hours, but there'll be a 10 euro entrance fee on top of that as well. Overall, I'm actually pretty pleased with it. They, did, they do need control over tourism in Venice. It's such a popular place and it's such an amazing place that this is the right step. And I'm keen to see how they maintain it and how it goes for Venice. Next on the travel news is an article I don't really like sharing that much because I don't really believe in this, but it's called The Safest Places to Travel in 2024. Very subjective and based on a lot of things. 
but this is from Deseret News and Alyssa Bradford wrote this and this was a travel insurance provider who released its annual statement and I guess the only good thing about this is these are facts based on claims submitted by people who were traveling to certain places and this is created by Berkshire Hathaway Travel Protection and they surveyed thousands of people so the top five countries there's no shocks here to travel in and they gave a tiny little blurb about what to look out for but not much detail so number one safest place is Canada right here the only thing to watch out for is wildfires that is a big thing actually in the summer number two is Switzerland petty crime such as pickpocketing is more so in the bigger cities but the main thing they say is weather conditions when skiing uh, I guess that can get a bit hairy so you need to keep an eye on that Norway is number three, nothing really goes on there. Ireland is number four, a very low murder rate compared to other countries, but petty crime is on the rise there, interestingly. And number five is the Netherlands. And Amsterdam is one of the world's safest cities, believe it or not, but tourists do need to watch out for theft. As long as you keep your bag locked up while you're away, you'll be good to go, according to those guys. And the last bit on the travel news is something called the Satuchi Travel Guide. So this is Japan's underrated gem where you won't find crowds of tourists like Esther Marshall in the Express. And this is a place I've not really heard of. So Satuchi is sometimes known as Japan's Mediterranean and it encompasses the Seto Inland Sea and several coastal areas of Honshu, Shikuku and Kyushu. And it's very popular to visit in maybe the cherry blossom season or the autumn. But good ways to go and see it is obviously outside of those. So like November, for example, which is what Esther done in her article. And you can see the autumn colour in all its glory. Home to some of the most beautiful cycle routes, a state-of-the-art floating gallery. And it's got Japan's tastiest oranges. And it's got to be on your bucket list for 2024. You can fly into Tokyo and then catch another flight to Hiroshima. Uh, we actually got the train. So if you get Japanese rail pass and you're there for two or three weeks, train is just as good, just as fast almost. Um, but if you're from the UK, you can fly with British Airways directly to Tokyo. And in Canada, if you're in the West Coast, I think any airline on the West Coast goes to Tokyo too. It's got islands, oranges, and high bridges that are very dizzying. And they built a fantastic cycle route, which has amazing views. And it's about 70 kilometers long. And it's one of the world's most beautiful journeys to take on two wheels. You can even get electric bikes to help you out because that's, that's quite a bit of a journey, 70 kilometers. Uh, they've got modern roads, cycle lanes, easy electric bike hire, and it's suitable for any ability on the bike. The area is known for its famous oranges and lemons, and you can go and visit some citrus farms along the way. Some interesting quirky things to do. You can get up close and personal with the work of one of the country's most famous architects, Simose Art Garden Villa. It's the architect Shiguri Ban, and he's designed 10 hotel villa style rooms and highlights include a house made entirely of cardboard paper tubes and one without any walls. An overnight stay there is gonna be absolutely costly and a hefty price tag, but you can go and visit for the day and then visit the hotel's floating art gallery. Looks pretty cool. There's a picture on the article of that as well. The temple gardens are breathtakingly beautiful as well, Esther says, and the color of the autumn is spectacular. And the museum's unique Zen meditation experience shouldn't be missed. And it's raked Zen Garden is a must see as the work is completed by just one monk. They've got some food recommendations as well. You can go and check out Hiroshima's oyster ship Kanawa. It's one of the most atmospheric restaurants. It floats in the river. Uh, I imagine it's quite expensive. Japan's not a cheap country, but it's a good introduction into the cuisine. Or you can get something very local and very typical for Japanese culture. You can get a taste of a monk's lifestyle with lunch at Shinjoji Temple Restaurant as you can experience guests dine on udon noodles and must clean their bowl just as the monks do with a pickle soaked in green tea. Plates can't be cleared until the pickle is eaten. <laughs> While tea soaked pickles might not be a flavour you want to bring back, it makes a fun and quirky experience. That's a great article. Um, I can put a link into that in my newsletter if you want to sign up today. And that is the travel news for today's episode. This is a Patreon shout out to Laura from the Swamp Soup Stickers, who has contributed £5 to the podcast on my Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate it. And it helps the podcast to keep going in the future. If you're interested, head to the show notes where you'll find a link to my Patreon. The website address is patreon.com forward slash winging it travel podcast. 
travel story. Today's quick travel story is one for myself in Oman when we tried to wild camp for the week, which was in the month of May last year. There's some episodes on that. But a very interesting lesson learned is that wild camping is all well and good, if that's the rule. But the second question should be, is there any facilities? And the answer to Oman is no. I don't think we particularly knew this that well. But in my mind, I was thinking, oh, OK, so they haven't got drinking water. But at least there'll be a nice cubicle or something to have a toilet. So when we started to pitch up in certain areas of Oman, we quickly realised there's absolutely zero facilities for wild camping. And that meant you need to grab your spade or your shovel and go and dig your own little hole to go and do your business. Now, the practicalities are quite tough in 30 degree heat. You've got to find somewhere, dig your hole, and you've got to squat. And obviously when you're doing your number two, you don't misdirect the nuggets coming out. And then you've got the flies all around you and it's very uncomfortable and you're not used to squat and your legs start to shake. It was a really earthy experience. I learned a lot about myself in about a minute of doing that, or two minutes, should we say. But it did require you having a spade, digging your hole, finding somewhere, and I guess digging it back up. All very nature, all very organic. But just bear in mind, if you're going to a mine to wild camp, there are no facilities to have a toilet. And you're going to have to plan that, if you do need that, onto certain locations like a cafe or a restaurant, or even like we found a golf course once and just had to go in aircon and chill out. Made harder by the temperature being 30 degrees. It wasn't a nice experience and it's very sweaty, not too messy, but earthy experience. I hope you're cringing right now. Cheers. Guest reaction. Today's guest reaction is with the last episode with my guest, Tyler Wachowski, a guy who does so many creative projects on the go. I do wonder how he keeps up with all the tasks he has to do to keep those companies going. Uh, in his previous life, he was a communications and marketing expert. So he has that knowledge and that know-how in marketing himself and the business. And it's a great episode if you want to get an idea of what someone did do in the past in terms of a corporate job and felt like they just had to leave it and the struggles with that and then going into doing their own things. Now, I don't think I've met anyone who's done so many different things on the go at the minute. Uh, normally, one person goes to do one thing. I quite like the cook the books business that he's got. Um, it's helping independent writers by giving a fair percentage of book sales in return for all the stuff like editing, marketing, putting the book out there, publishing, all that sort of stuff. I think the percentage that was put on the podcast was 60-40 in favour of the writer. Now, if you're aware or unaware of what major publishing companies do, they kind of give you an advance. And then you need to make money back on that advance. So let's say they give you $5,000 and your book is worth $50. You're going to have to sell 100 copies first to pay back. And then anything after is kind of split 5%, 10% in your favour. So it's not great. So I would recommend if you're listening right now that you're going to write a book to listen to the episode and get an idea of Tyler's thinking on that because he really wants to help independent writers and not kind of take the piss really. Um, so they're called Cook the Books. That's a good little business he's got going on. And he talks very openly in his podcast and in his writing. He's released a number of books and he does blogging. He's got a new book coming out. He talks very openly about his mental health journey through the years. I guess that comes from childhood leading into the corporate job and the struggles with that into now this new lifestyle that he has where he's now on a venture around the USA in the camp van. And he's got two or three years worth of travels planned out. It's an interesting conversation. A lot about business, a lot about travel, also a lot about planned travel. I think he's got like next three years kind of mapped out. So if you're interested in that, a great guy, great episode. Check it out on last week's guest episode. Did you know or travel fact? This week's did you know or travel fact is based on actually an article I read in the BBC by Heidi Fuller Love about Samarkand in Uzbekistan. I have talked about Samarkand a number of times on the podcast, and I'll come to that in a minute about who you can check out. But in Central Asia, it's kind of the unknown area of Asia, really, that many people don't seem to know much about. But it is, I guess, to put in quotation marks, up and coming for an area of the world to go and check out. And Samarkand in Uzbekistan is a very interesting place. The 
title of the article was called Central Asia's Glittering New Silk Road Jewel. And I can give you some facts about Samarkand and Uzbekistan first before delving into what the article said. But it's situated in the southeastern part of Uzbekistan and it's one of the oldest continuous living cities in Central Asia. It was a trading hub for two and a half thousand years on the old Silk Road. And one of the best things to go and see in the old town is Shai Zinda, which is the holiest site in Uzbekistan. It's a giant necropolis dedicated to Muhammad's cousin, Kazim Ibn Abbas. And it looks incredible. I remember doing some research before and getting the photos up on Google and I just could not believe what I was seeing. And also all the blogs I've read, just that colourful architecture of blue, white, very spacious history is incredible so i think it is one of those countries that's very safe to travel to now and very easy to get to they have a brand new airport which is about 20 minutes from the city and it's built or reconstructed last year so it's brand new and you can get a taxi or bus from there into the town and city of samarkand it's going to cost you around two to five us dollars for that as well so this article talks about a couple of things that are very interesting. So the current president, and forgive my pronunciation here, Shavkat Mirziyoyev, spoke of creating like a new Uzbekistan with a reform in the judiciary, liberalisation of the economy, and new policy of transparency and tolerance. So there has been certain issues that have been addressed. That's a great step forward. And that has coincided with an increase of tourists to the country because now certain issues have been addressed. Um, there's... For example, slave labour was finally banned in March 2022, way too late. But loads of Uzbekistan children were in the fields picking cotton and stuff. And I think they are one of the biggest producers of cotton in the world. But there are still slightly some concerns about human rights in other areas. And that fear of that is kind of on the minds of local shop owners because they think tourists won't visit. But I do think tourists are starting to visit the area. It's got one of the fastest growing populations in the world and one of the youngest, but unemployment is on the rise. Uh, more than 11% of the population live below the poverty line and the average monthly wage is around 300 US dollars and nearly 2 million Uzbeks work abroad, most of them in Russia because Russian is spoken in the country, but quite a few are coming home. So that's causing some issues to infrastructure, jobs and housing, I guess. They built this fantastic looking an expensive looking facility it's about 20 minutes from the airport it's called the silk road samarkand resort and it's like huge grandiose it's got eight skyscraper style luxury hotels and wellness centers clustered around a wide canal that was once used to train rowan champions during soviet times it's linked by cycle paths and planted with thousands of tiny saplings and the site is still new and raw so through the gaps in the trees you can still see the Tatty prefab buildings, that's a quote from the article, where 15,000 workers lived during the two and a half years it took to build, and it's the largest complex of its kind, it costs around 580 billion US dollars. And it's built from the local oil and property oligarch, Bahitoyo Vazilov, and a Chinese hotel group. So Uzbekistan's got this interesting mix of incredible history, two and a half thousand years worth, and it's got this incredible new wave of modernity about it that's trying to get into in terms of tourism so i think it's definitely got that blend and you can definitely see both sides with an open mind and apparently the Uzbek people are incredibly friendly and it's on my list to go and see if you want more information about uzbekistan also samarkand you can check out a previous episode of mine with lex Dekovsky. it's episode 66 it's an early one and he traveled the world a couple of times and he went to Uzbekistan and could not believe what he was seeing in Samarkand and also the country as a whole. So more information and stories are on that one. And I think it's a country that probably you should get in your minds in the next couple of years, because I do think it's going to explode with tourism in the future. Brand updates. The new website, wingingittravelpodcast.com, is live. So now the hard work starts. I've built it over the last, yeah, I think I started a couple of months ago and it's finally live. This is version one and it's going to house all the important information about the podcast. So on there is going to be links to all the providers who have the podcast. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify and my YouTube channel, etc. And it's going to house contact forms on there, how to be a sponsor, 
I've got some blogs on there about the guests from this year. I've got ways to support the podcast. And I've got my book review service on there. It's now going to house everything. So I'm now going to take jameshammond.org away and replace it with that website. The problem being that James Hammond Org has kind of been clicked upon for three years. So if you pop Wooden Age Travel Podcast in Google, that is still going to come up. So I might take that offline for the time being. And I'm going to restructure that website to be more of a business type website for myself outside of the podcast. So yeah, Wooden Age Travel Podcast.com. Please spread the news. Please click on it as well. It'd be, be nice to have a quick click in the show notes. You'll see it there. Get some traction and get some traffic to there. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Any improvements, any critiques, love to hear them because I'm quite new to building websites. I quite enjoyed it, but I don't know too much about it. But I think it looks okay. I've done the desktop and the mobile look, and I think it covers most bases. And the only thing to come in the future is the blogs. I need to write them and then house them on there. So I'm really excited to get that live. For the YouTube channel, I finally passed 200 subscribers. So I had a good couple of weeks. My Norwich video has been the most viewed so far. Uh, I think it's approaching 175 views, which is quite close to my 200 subscribers. I've got some YouTube shorts in there to hit four and 6,000 views, which is great as well. And now I intend to keep that going and keep releasing weekly episodes. Um, I did have, on the flip side, my latest episode is a bit of a bum. It didn't really get anything. I think it's got like 10 views at the minute, if that. So I now know that my YouTube audience do not want to see coffee as so much. Um, but it's good to know. Lesson learned. And please subscribe today if you're not subscribed already. And give a few videos a watch. Uh, a couple of videos I can recommend. I'll put it the last four or five. They've all hit above 100 views. And you've got stuff like the Micro Nations tour in there that we did a year ago and then we got the Norwich one a few weeks ago as well. If you like coffee, Oman coffee scene is thriving. So there's information about that too. Please follow and subscribe today. I appreciate it. Audience question. I got given a question the other day for this section about how do you plan a road trip in a country like Oman, as I mentioned previously. We always knew that we want to go and wild camp in Oman but if I'm honest, the kind of logistics of it wasn't really planned out until we got near the time, but even on the ground. So what I'd advise first is if you're a real planner and you want to get something on the go straight away, when you're flying to Muscat, there's a couple of things you need to do. You need to go and get a SIM card. You can buy them at the airport. They're the same price across the country. And I think there's like two or three companies down there. Go and get a SIM card and pay for a month's worth of data because you're going to need it. And also sometimes you're going to need that phone number. So don't be afraid. Go and get the SIM card and speak to the guys at the front desk. They will speak English. That's key for a road trip. Now, what we did is we got the taxi into Muscat and hung around Muscat for three days before going on the road trip. Now, Muscat is not a walking city. We did walk about in the heat, but it's quite brutal, actually. And luckily, we had a couple of things near our hotel. If I was to go back myself, I'd advise myself to go and get the car straight away from Muscat and drive into the city. So that's what I would advise you. Go and order your rental car at Muscat Airport, pick it up and drive it into town. Now Muscat has two kind of areas of the city that's new and old. The old is going to be a bit more smaller in terms of the street size and more little lanes and souks, whereas the new area of town is a bit more wider, what well, I'd say normal roads. Very easy country to drive in. The roads across the country are brand new, pretty much, all paved. And you can go fair whack in terms of distance and speed, but the country is huge. So in terms of planning a road trip like a man, you've got to pick, if you've got a week or 10 days, pick two, three or four things you really want to see and plan your route. There's not many roads to go down. And we didn't have really have a problem with any of the roads apart from one time Google took us a weird way and it kind of ran out, but um, we got around it in the end. Because if you have a SIM card, you can always research on the side of the road. They do have lots of petrol stations. The gas is extremely cheap. I'm talking like 25, 30 cents a litre. So in terms of the cost of that, very reasonable. We picked three or four locations, planned the route, had our SIM card, had our rental car, stuck to the rules and the speed limits. And for anything like ferries, you can just turn up, book. And uh, there's no real online service for that. So you might have to queue up like physically in a location to get a ferry. 
if you go to one of the islands, that's cool, no worries. The money is a, a great set of people. And the only bit of advice I'd give in terms of the car, get a 4x4. Four four. Because if you want to go and drive up some mountain passes and some roads, the requirement is a 4x4. Four four. We had a 2x4 four and that was a bit of a problem for some areas. So get a 4x4, four four, get your tents and go and wild camp, but just don't do it in the summer. We saw a lot of sites, a lot of staying by the beach. If you're going to be in sort of warm weather, stick to the coast to get that breeze. And it's a very safe country. You can literally stay anywhere, but there's no facilities. Just bear that in mind. If you need any help with booking a tour or a guide or a car or tenting equipment, I have a great recommendation for you. You can speak to Chris at nomadtours.com. He has all those services. He adds you to a WhatsApp group. This group is very helpful because they have current travelers in the country at that moment. So there could be some recommendations in there. If you need some help, you can message in the group. You can also message Chris. He's been in Muscat for, I think, 20 odd years. He's got a lot of contacts. And it's a great way to feel safe when traveling country because you've got a group of travelers in that WhatsApp group who message to say this road is great, this area is great. They give some coordinates on Google, whatever it is. It just makes that peace of mind a little bit easier. So, yeah, any questions, give me a shout. Happy to answer them. And that is today's audience question. <laughs> Travel <laughs> joke. Did you hear about the pilot who decided to cook whilst flying? It was a recipe for disaster. Hey, yeah, just a quick one. I just want to say there are many ways to support this podcast. You can buy me a coffee and help support the podcast with $5. Or you can go to my merch store with the affiliate link with T Public, where there's plenty of merch available to buy, such as t-shirts, jumpers, hoodies, and also some children's clothing. Thirdly, which is free, you can also rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, or Good Pods. Also, you can find me on social media on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. Simply just search for Winging It Travel Podcast, and you'll find me displaying all my social media content for traveling podcast and other stuff thank you